All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the early afternoon session of the Washington Bike, Walk and Roll Summit presented by Amazon. Uh, we're gonna give folks just a couple minutes to get into the space. So feel free to get comfortable, grab some water or some lunch. Um, and as you come in, please feel free to put your name, where you're calling in from into the chat bar so that folks can know where we're all joining into this conversation from. Um, and again, I hope you're having a great afternoon. And this is our session on Vision Zero enforcement and alternatives to policing in active transportation, just so that you are sure you're in the right place. But get comfortable, we'll get started in just a moment. All right, we're gonna get started here. Um, again, welcome everybody to the Washington Bike, Walk and Roll Summit presented by Amazon. I'm Tamar, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the community organizer at Cascade Bicycle Club. We're excited for this summit. We're excited to have over 600 registrants for this five-day virtual event. And we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The summit is virtual, and those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge the land Cascade Bicycle Club sits on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. Without them, we would not have access to this environment, and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. If you don't know whose land you're on, you can look in the chat in just a few minutes where I'll put a link to a map where you can find your place on the land. We'd also like to note as we get started that we are recording this session and that the recording will be available following the summit. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington state, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride and holding rides and events. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We wanna take a moment also to thank our sponsors, whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panels with expert speakers and free registration for all attendees. So thank you to Amazon, our presenting sponsor. Thanks also to our supporting sponsors, the Washington State Department of Transportation, Active Transportation Division, and Eastern Washington Region, and also to our general sponsors, the U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration, and Stacey Bain Bike Lawyer. So with that, and before we transition into introducing this excellent summit, we'd like to take a moment to articulate the community norms that we have for each summit session. We will maintain a standard of conduct to ensure that all participants feel safe and respected. We believe every person has the right to be treated with dignity and respect and to be free from all forms of harassment. We ask that you be fully present in this session, be self-responsible and self-challenging, listen and process, suspend judgment of yourself and others, and use respectful language towards each other and the panel. If you have any questions or concerns during the session, please feel free to reach out to the chat monitors through the personal message feature of our chat bar. So with that, I'm incredibly honored and excited to be introducing this session and panelists. This session is Vision Zero, Enforcement and Alternatives to Policing and Active Transportation. Our panelists are Becky Gilliam from the Safe Routes Partnership, Dong Ho Chang, who will be representing the Cooper Jones Active Transportation Safety Advisory Council, and Juan Jose Bocanegra from Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, Whose Streets Our Streets Work Group. They'll be talking about how ethics and efficacy around policing and enforcement have always been critical conversations in the transportation field, but recently there have been major changes to the traditional role of policing and enforcement in bike law and policy. Our panelists will be sharing their experiences and work with alternatives to enforcement in active transportation and will offer input and recommendations on those alternatives for communities around Washington and beyond. So for the format, we're starting off with this piece of introduction and then I'll be passing it along to our panelists for their presentation pieces for about 40 minutes. And at the end, we'll have time for audience Q&A. 
Attendees are encouraged to be asking questions and putting your comments into the chat bar at the bottom of your screen throughout these presentations, and we'll be asking those during that 10 minute Q&A period. Also, your feedback is greatly appreciated, and so we'll be providing a feedback Google form at the end of the presentation in that same chat bar, and it'll also be available by email at the end of the day. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll be passing it along to Dong Ho, who is our first presenter. So thank you all for being here today. Hello, everyone. Um, I am going to uh, do a quick um, slide show. Uh, about uh, streets that serve all users, um, particularly uh, national perspective and especially in Seattle. So uh, we in the transportation industry uh, that serve the community use uh, various design manuals and street, uh, street design uh, manuals and control manuals uh, to allocate and control how people uh, interface and interact in our streets. Um, the design of how streets are uh, typically uh, developed is um, uh, state highway officials. So state highway agencies on all 50 states, they come uh, together uh, along with other stakeholders and create this uh, policy on geometric design of highways and streets. It's called the Asheville Green Book. And it's being updated right now. But historically, this manual has um, developed and it does have a lot of flexibility, but uh, applying the, uh, the design controls and the guidance that's uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that manual creates a street that you can see here in Aurora, uh, which is to uh, have a certain lane width, geometry, and spaces uh, for vehicles, and oftentimes uh, uh, have not really thought about the environment where people who are outside the vehicles uh, are operating. There's also a manual that looks at how to determine how the roadway is functioning. It's called the Highway Capacity Manual, um, designed for uh, uh, freeways and uh, streets like this, um, and you uh, uh, measure what's called level of service, and uh, that provides some measure of how that street is operating in terms of, a, of the experience from the vehicle, and that paradigm is slowly changing as well on uh, really looking at encompassing uh, uh, really the, how is that street uh, functioning for the intended purpose. There's also a manual that looks at how uh, the controls on that street is uh, uh, managed. It's called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it's uh, 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 a federal manual uh, dictated by law that uh, all streets on, uh, that public travels on must uh, conform to and follow. And believe it or not, uh, WashDOT has been uh, the leader in terms of leading this transformational changes uh, on all these manuals um, and that uh, it is uh, changing to uh, look at uh, really the purpose of the street and uh, revising uh, practice that have created this uh, type of environment for people. Um, this is just north of there and you can see um, the, the paradigm of uh, trying to move as much uh, a vehicle through as efficiently as possible has created um, uh, unintended consequence. Here, there's a overpass where pedestrians are expected to cross. There was no crosswalks there um, uh, because there was an overpass. But what about a person who um, uh, has some mobility challenges and in a wheelchair, how is that person supposed to cross? Um, and so we're making incremental and very slow changes uh, we need to make that change much, much quicker and uh, uh, dedicate resources uh, uh, in a much more uh, restorative way. Our state law <laughs> follows a lot of what uh, mo model laws uh, throughout the nation. And there is a state law that talks about uh, pedestrians on roadway. And it's unlawful for people to walk on a road where sidewalks are provided. And it's really intended to uh, separate vehicles from uh, pedestrians, right? Um, and that is the safest uh, as aspect. But what about locations where, um, you know, there is blockages or there is uh, discontinuity? And um, uh, in this time of COVID, it really shows that the, the uh, allocation of uh, space is really not equitable. Um, there is also a, a provision in this law that says that if there is a sidewalk, uh, you're supposed to walk facing traffic uh, and then upon 
meeting a oncoming vehicle, um, you're supposed to move clear of the roadway. And I'm not sure um, that's really uh, uh, feasible in many uh, streets like this. This is up in Golden Gardens, where um, the road is really, uh, uh, has no facility for people who are walking. Um, and who are we serving and who are we excluding uh, when we're uh, putting resources for our streets like this? Um, and at intersections, uh, that's where everybody comes together, right? The vehicles and pedestrians who are crossing. Um, and there is a law that talks about uh, uh, that space where if you have a walk and don't walk symbol, a when the walk symbol comes up, uh, you can begin your crossing. But as soon as the flashing don't walk uh, 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 comes up, um, your sh uh, pedestrian shall not enter the roadway. Um, in these days where we have countdown timers, I tell you how much time you have left in order to cross the street. Maybe this is not the, the, uh, the best approach. And then of course, a person who is not, uh, doesn't have the uh, vision to see that is, uh, there's a walk, how are we serving uh, uh, those users who are much more vulnerable? So we really have to think about uh, uh, changing our laws um, so that these kind of interactions and, uh, uh, and really uh, uh, having our system uh, be able to uh, serve our uh, serve our communities uh, much better. Um, we've been utilizing uh, um, all-way walks, which is our uh, barn stands, right? Uh, so the pedestrians have uh, full time to uh, use uh, to cross the cross the street. But according to this law, um, when the flashing don't walk starts, you're not supposed to enter, even though there's no conflict with the vehicles. Again, I think uh, there there are ways to uh, mitigate and changes, uh, change our um, our laws and how we design our streets uh, so that uh, we minimize uh, uh, the need for um, uh, uh, police enforcement. Again, th those are encounters that uh, we, uh, we can do with engineering and, and our laws. And of course, the consequence of a lot of our um, uh, uh, injuries in our streets is uh, based on vehicle speeds. 60% um, of our, our uh, of our street network are um, our residential streets and 40 are arterial, uh, but 90% of our uh, injuries and serious injuries and fatalities occur on arterial streets. So, uh, pretty much, uh, uh, our residential streets are very safe. And the reason why they are safe is because they are engineered that way. And I just uh, want to highlight that 60% uh, uh, of our uh, street network in Seattle look like this. Um, they're fairly narrow, uh, they're parking on both sides. Uh, you're just not able to go very fast. But engineering these uh, type of treatments, um, you can uh, uh, create an environment where interactions are very slow and that the opportunity for any kind of uh, interaction uh, 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 for higher speed is really minimized. And I will end my uh, uh, presentation here. All right, thanks, Dong Ho. Hello, everybody. I'm just gonna get my screen share here. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. I'm going to talk with you all a bit about dropping enforcement from the six E's of the Safe Routes to School framework. So hello, my name is Becky Gilliam. I'm a regional policy manager at the Safe Routes Partnership. I live in Silverton, Oregon, which is on Kalapuya traditional lands, and I live a multimodal lifestyle here, and I use she, her pronouns. So um, now that I've introduced myself, I'm actually going to turn off my camera because it helps a bit with my connection, I believe. Okay, so I hope you'll stick with me as I move through these slides. So just a quick uh, agenda of what I'm gonna discuss today. I'll share a little bit more about who we are at the Safe Routes Partnership. I'll discuss the six E's framework of Safe Routes to School and the traditional role of police in uh, Safe Routes to School and how that is problematic. I will also share some alternatives to policing and enforcement and a discussion on adding engagement to the E's. And I'll finish off with sharing a couple of resources with you all. 
So the Safe Routes Partnership works to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools and in everyday life, improving the health and well being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities, and building healthy, thriving communities for everyone. Our organization began that work with schools in mind, but we quickly realized that what's good for getting kids safely to school on foot and bike is good for moving people of all ages through their communities to all kinds of everyday destinations. What do we mean by safe? Our organization's definition of safety has always been broader than traffic violence to include safety from bullying, harassment, physical violence, threats, or intimidation. And our policy and programmatic recommendations reflect those goals. In addition to all of these things we're trying to avoid, a key goal of Safe Routes to School is to promote healthy, holistic, thriving communities. We want kids to arrive at school ready to learn. We want them to be able to run, skip, play, and bike in their communities in their fullest expression of selves. And we want more than just not being killed. We want kids to be joyful and enjoy their childhoods. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our six E's framework in case you're not familiar with it. We know that to improve safe routes to school, we need both environmental change and behavioral change. Comprehensive safe routes to school initiatives have been shown to be more effective at increasing physical activity and reducing injuries. The six E's of safe routes to school summarize those key components of a comprehensive integrated approach. So here on your screen, you should see the six E's. We have education, engineering, evaluation, encouragement, enforcement, um, up until recently, and equity. So if we aren't proactively working towards equity, we are passively or inadvertently maintaining the status quo, which is inequitable. And our approach at the partnership has been to both infuse equity throughout the other E's, uh, but also call it out as its own separate E. So a little more on enforcement. In many places, police don't actually have a huge role in safe routes to school. They are often a partner or at the table because it's been recommended that they be, but there actually aren't that many places where police are the critical foundation to safe routes to school programs. And in places where they do play a more significant role, it appears that it is because of the way funding flows. So programs may need to involve police in order to access a particular funding stream, which it's worth noting is something we can work to change. So what is the traditional role of police in safe routes to school? Well, we see them educating students about traffic safety, um, being used to enforce uh, street closures for special events. We've also seen police conducting speed surveys around schools and communities. And most concerning, we see targeted enforcement of traffic laws. So what's the problem? Well, there are entire books and doctoral dissertations written on this, so I'm just going to give a couple of highlights. Since the dawn of zoning history, zoning and land use planning have had complicated and multidimensional effects on health and equity. From interstate highway development that put a barrier between white and black neighborhoods and displacing communities of color, to industrial zoning laws and siting of facilities that spew toxins into our air and water, to land use laws that require bike ped improvements in infrastructure for communities with wealth and often the opposite for low income communities. We know that these tools have both intentionally and unintentionally promoted segregation by race and income. So our first problem I wanna call out is that enforcing traffic laws that are predicated upon racially unjust choices perpetuates those injustices. I'm gonna go through a couple more slides with headlines that will not surprise you and some of you have already even seen earlier this week during our sessions with Charles Brown or maybe you've even seen them before. So take a look at these headlines, notice the patterns and I'll call out some additional issues that we see with police involvement in safe routes to school. Um, Ticketing targets Black, Indigenous, people of color, and working poor families. From a Minneapolis study where Black cyclists make up almost half of those ending up with incident or arrest reports after being stopped for a biking citation, 
despite making up only 18% of the total Minneapolis population. To a ProPublica report out of Jacksonville, Florida, this city's population is 29% Black, but Black pedestrians receive 55% of the pedestrian tickets issued from 2012 to 2017. And in Chicago, more than twice as many citations are being written for African American communities than in white or Latino areas. The top 10 community areas for bike tickets from 08 to 2016 included seven that are majority African American and three that are majority Latino. Not a single majority white area ranked in the top 10, despite biking's popularity in white areas. And let's also talk about speeding tickets. Speeding tickets are among the most popular tool aimed at deterring speeders, yet there is inadequate research on their efficacy. A longitudinal study aimed to understand how effective speeding tickets were at deterring future speeding and found that people who received a speeding ticket were more than two times as likely to receive a subsequent speeding ticket. Simply put, it's not very effective and it doesn't change driver behavior. From getting a ticket while you're walking or biking, or if it's a speeding ticket while you're operating a car, we know that traffic fines are disproportionately impacting our low-income people and people of color. At the core of what we've come to understand is that although many people were brought up to think that police keep us safe, that is simply not the case for so many people. That may not be your lived experience, it's not mine, but it's other people's real lived experience and it matters that we trust it and take action accordingly. As a movement that is focused on the safety, health, and well being of children, we need to listen to families who are telling us that police actually make them feel less safe. So let's explore some of the alternatives available to us as we remove policing from safe routes to school. We can invest in what we know works, reimagining our built environment, engineering our streets and roads to be slower and safer by design. We can teach and encourage kids and families to walk and bike and help lead safety campaigns to reduce speeds. We can use features like bollards and jersey barricades. These are features that effectively close off the road for fun events and temporary events. Um, but not through intimidation or overtime payment. And are police the right people to be educating students? Not necessarily. Rather than using police to fit helmets and teach kids to ride bikes, consider opportunities to use league certified instructors and people trained in child pedagogy. We can also invest or reinvest in our crossing guard and public safety uh, ambassador programs. We can explore opportunities to work to support community resiliency, connecting with local programs and working with CBOs. And instead of having police conduct speed surveys, that can also be done by um, your Department of Transportation, Departments of Public Works and engineering firms. So in June, you may have seen or heard that we made the decision that we can no longer support enforcement as part of the six E's framework. This is the result of years of discussion and action, not an impulse reaction. Historically, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to downplay and de-emphasize police law enforcement. But we have realized we cannot fix something that is so broken. And as I mentioned before, we really need to listen to families who are telling us that police are making them feel less safe. We need to trust those voices and take action accordingly. So with enforcement being dropped from the six E's, we're instead leading with engagement. Why is engaging the community important to building a Safe Routes to School program? Meaningful community engagement is essential in creating a sustainable and successful program that lasts. Engagement means building Safe Routes to School leaders and champions, not just participants. Engagement means a shared program vision and the importance of valuing and trusting others' lived experiences as valid. This is less about loss and more about opportunity. Consider what we stand to gain by removing enforcement and adding engagement. 
Research tells us this, and we know it from our experience. There are people in communities that have been systematically excluded from safe routes to school as we know it. And some other thoughts to ponder. We can build relationships with community members, relationships that are more authentic and lasting. We can reach pockets of our school communities who we haven't been able to involve in the past. And we're seeing that the diversity of opinions leads to creativity and innovation. Change is necessary and it can lead to great things. We have the chance to increase safety, rates of kids walking and biking, build social connections and cohesion. So I did wanna include a couple of resources that we currently have available at the website at Safe Routes Partnership. Um, these are a couple of articles and resources and ideas of how we are shifting our focus to lead with engagement. And I also included a couple of resources from partnering agencies, including uh, Untokening and the Abolition Study Group Guide. So those will be available in the slides uh, following today's presentation. And finally, here are some things to watch for. We are holding two Zoom sessions that are trainings with Safe Routes to School coordinators and advocates across the country. Both of those are full, but we really are looking forward to the dialogue that will emerge to help us inform future resources. And we will be sharing more resources around engineering alternatives to enforcement and a more robust toolkit on how to lead with engagement. So once again, I wanna thank you for your time and I will hand it over to our next panelist. Thank you, Becky. My name is uh, Juan Jose Bocanegra and <clears throat> I'm working with uh, the committee that's working on the house on the street issues uh, previously presented by uh, Compañero Dong Shang. Um, one of the issues that, <clears throat> that we've been looking at is the whole issue of enforcement and who the who enforcement uh, is most affects people in our communities, communities of color. One of the interesting things that, that we have uh, been di discussing within the coalition and in the committee has been that <clears throat> there are traffic and enforcement um, seems to be a very punitive uh, process for, for communities. You know, we, we tend to think of justice um, as a way of trying to bring about equity and that laws are needed in order to, for us to keep um, justice alive. <clears throat> but one of the things that we end up finding is that there is no real um, sense of justice when people are being given tickets uh, because there are enforcement cameras, because there are um, you know, they don't have driver's license or they don't have uh, insurance. Many of those are, are conditions that are set forth by, by the state and, and are really important parts, but they don't really uh, help people that are trying to get to and from home to work and or around the city. We have a very, um, you know, our cities are not designed, they're not planned out in such a way to meet the needs of uh, people in the communities. They're planned out mostly to meet the needs of businesses. And if you look at most of our, our cities, we tend to uh, create our, our living situations around businesses rather than businesses around <clears throat> people that are living in, in our cities. Um, and it's, so in, in many ways, it's very anarchistic of how cities have been developed. And for that same uh, nature, the, the streets and access uh, to services or to goods or anything else. <clears throat> and having worked in the, in the downtown area for many years, one of the things that we learned is that the people that have the most contact with the police are people of color because they are the ones that are either homeless or have no access or have very little relationship to the community and are just, you know, 
unemployed or uh, semi-employed, but are not really part of the ongoing everyday business uh, community in, and are seen as being as loitering or any of those um, ways of looking at, at people in the community. And one of the things that we end up having to look at is how do we go about changing this punitive nature of, of policing? You know, first, as, as they did in uh, Berkeley, is to remove the police from uh, enforcement of traffic or of that particular aspect of, of uh, our community, the whole issue of uh, making you know, transportation, uh, restraining transportation through law. And so we need to start looking at that because the, if one thing has, we have learned from COVID is that it has opened up the, the problems that we have in our communities and has magnified those problems a thousandfold. Uh, and, you know, when we start talking about, you know, how do we block off streets so that people can have access, which is a great idea. You know, we don't have that many cars traveling in our streets because of the COVID. Uh, there's better use for our streets. The only problem is that because of the nature of how people are spread out, only certain people get to benefit from the streets being closed. The people that could also benefit, but because of the nature of having been displaced from the inner city out into the suburbs, uh, you end up having people that cannot, don't have that equity uh, access to the streets that are being blocked off for enjoyment and for bicycling and for all the good uh, things that people in the urban city and in the inner city uh, take advantage of. Um, and not all, right? I mean, it's just folks that like, that live, have the uh, ability to live by the, uh, what we call the Gold Coast uh, here in, in, the, uh, in the Puget Sound area. And the Gold Coast, of course, is, is kind of a, a funny name of, of uh, showing that that's where all the rich folks live. And all this real rearranging and all this reimagining uh, our cities and our streets will take money. And unfortunately, you know, we're being taxed already to, uh, in a very uneven and unequal way in the state of Washington when we have uh, the, the rich only paying a very small amount of taxes or hardly any taxes at all and the vast majority of all the, the cost of running the city are placed on the back of workers. You know, that goes hand in hand with, with uh, for us trying to, to reimagine our city, trying to accommodate our, our population so that we have better access to the space that we have, we can reclaim as public land again, so that we don't have to be using it for traffic uses and have people have access to them. And one of the things that we lack in our inner cities is public, public lands for public use, uh, for mingling, uh, you know, for just enjoying and providing cultural activities. If you don't go to a park, you don't have any other access to, to living in the, in the inner city. We have no plazas. We don't have any um, large, outside of the Seattle Center, we don't have in the neighborhoods large gathering places uh, where we can um, come together and, and mingle and have cultural events. Uh, you know, we end up, folks end up having those events in front of Rainier High School because that's the only plaza that's available. You know, so we, as we start looking at, at trying to reimagine the cities and we start talking about you know, reimagining police enforcement. Um, you know, we have to take into account that any, um, almost all these efforts are going to take a certain amount of resources, and those resources cannot be placed on the backs of workers any longer. The business community has to take on its own share of the costs that it's going to take us for us to restructure our cities and re. Uh, 
recreate the, uh, our ability to reclaim our public lands and, and use them in such a way that it will benefit all of us. If, you know, we, we, we're gonna be, continuous to have this kinds of, of medical issues, uh, COVIDs, the viruses. This is like a never ending kind of situation for us. But it also gives us the opportunity to reimagine or recreate our living environment as, as we see fit, and also our financial environment. Because we, we, know, we need to start creating the kind of environment where everybody has access to resources, where everybody has access and has the ability to uh, get, what do you, how do you call that? Um, you know, be successful in life. Not just survive, but thrive. I mean, one of the things that, that we have um, seen over the, over the years as people of color is that, you know, white folks seem to enjoy their lives while people of color end up trying to enjoy our lives and we create the kinds of conditions that we, that we, that we need and are either relegated into ghettos or barrios or the worst parts of the land as, as, uh, as natives were pushed off their own lands, it's the same thing. It's just a continuation of that same mentality. The land that is the best use is the one that people that have the most resources have. And the worst land or the, the land that, that uh, is discarded for uh, industrial use or is where most of the communities of color are sent to. And we've got to start changing that kind of formula because it's not working out for anybody. Um, you know, we, people of color cannot just continue to be the essential workers for the enjoyment of others. And so we need to start looking at how we recreate our lives and how we recreate our society. And it's gonna take us, it's gonna take all of us, you know, without insulting each other, without, um, you know, feeling guilty about what's happened in the past, but to look toward the future and making sure that we do change um, our society because we have to depend on each other. And, and that's the only way we're gonna make this kinds of, of lasting long-term changes if we begin to have dialogue and, and be inclusive of other communities. And so that's, that's really about it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you all. It's really incredible to hear the perspectives of Zhang Ho, your engineering background, Becky, this experience of policing in a sort of case study of a school setting, and Quan, it's really great to hear the advocate perspective on this as well. And um, we have some great questions coming in, and some of them are specific to each panelist, some of them are applicable to all of you. So I think I'll start with sort of a round robin of individualized questions, if that works. Um, and Dong Ho, I'd love to start with you. But if all of our panelists would like to come back on screen and we can sort of get into conversation zone. Um, so Dong Ho, there's a question around, and it's, this has come up multiple times in the summit of engineering and the automation of controls, the automation of enforcement, and the ways in which that presents potential solutions and also potential problems in terms of equity. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are um, around automation of enforcement, automation of this control. Yeah, there's um, obviously a couple different ways. One could be punitive, which is that automated enforcement um, where a person who is violating uh, uh, the rules might be speeding, it might be running a red light, uh, blocking a box or using a bus lane, um, they, they get a monetary penalty um, to discourage that behavior. What we found in our implementation in Seattle is that uh, they're very effective. You get a ticket once and then you don't get a ticket again. So it changes behavior and it's long lasting. It actually lasts beyond the school zone hours actually. So um, uh, 
but it's temporary, right? So it's only when, when it's in place and it, it is punitive. Um, the better way to do it is to really uh, create a street that uh, gets the behavior uh, and the interaction that uh, you anticipate. And so um, really uh, uh, developing our street system and our streets illustrated and how we're designing streets uh, kind of have those ingredients in mind uh, where we're putting the uh, design controls like speed humps and raised intersections and raised crosswalks, narrow lanes, uh, spaces for people, parklets, all those things that uh, 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 create the environment that we want. Uh, but we also need to uh, recognize that um, uh, there's some unintended consequences. Um, as we're doing this, uh, these projects uh, uh, through COVID, um, we, you know, we very quickly understood that there was a need for people to be able to use a street to social distance and have some space to recreate. Um, and we followed Oakland's example of uh, closing streets, residential uh, uh, bicycle ways, um, uh, so that uh, there's ability for people to have that um, social distancing. Um, what we uh, what we quickly found was that in our central district, um, th you know, there was some some negative interaction where again uh, some people didn't feel comfortable in that space where, where there, there was some uh, saying, "Hey, you don't belong in this neighborhood. You don't look. It looks like you're." going to cause trouble, I'm gonna call the police on you, right? Uh, those kind of interaction is not something that, that we anticipated. And we need to really uh, think about these actions and how it uh, disproportionately impacts people who don't have a voice and who've been marginalized in the past and that ensure that when we're applying these tools that we're mitigating for them, understanding them, and then uh, making sure that we are applying them so that it's equitable for all, everyone. Great. Um, Becky, this next question is for you, and it's around sort of the process that went into dropping enforcement and reintroducing engagement um, in the six E's. And organizations like the League of American Bicyclists have recently dropped enforcement as well from their ease of bicycle-friendly cities. Um, I'm wondering how what that process looked like on the back end. How long had this been in the works? Sort of what had spurred it on, um, and was there a relationship between dropping enforcement and the recent Black Lives Matter movement and protests? Yeah, really good question. Thanks for that. Um, and I think I touched on this a little bit that our decision at the Safe Routes Partnership to drop enforcement is not an impulsive choice. Um, however, in with recent events and our community partners, our network, um, it has been more timely than ever, but frankly, many of our partners would have liked to have seen us do this sooner. Um, and it's the result of many years of engagement and discussion with outside organizations and partners. And we really spent the last five or six years trying to sort of, I think I said, downplay and de-emphasizing police law enforcement, um, but coming to a place where that's simply not enough and we need to be moving into more of a proactive space of taking action and um, not just simply dropping enforcement, but instead leading with engagement and strengthening our, our focus on equity throughout the six E's. Um, and if I could also just add, uh, I, I know you just asked this question of Dong Ho about automated enforcement and just to add on to your great points um, regarding, you know, ensuring placement doesn't target low income communities and communities of color and reinvesting in site specific engineering improvements, but also wanted to just add on top of that, um, considering providing income adjusted fines, if that's something, a tool that your community is looking at exploring. And Dong Ho, feel free to jump in on that. Um, just a note for folks is, Juan just let me know that he has been booted out of the call, the joys of webinar-based summits, but he'll be trying to come back in and we have questions for him so that in case he isn't able to rejoin us, he'll be able to see those questions and hopefully respond to them as he can. Um, so I'll just keep it between the three of us for now and hopefully Juan will be able to rejoin us. Um, Dong Ho, there have been a couple of questions around stay healthy streets. And I know that working in Seattle, you have experience with these and the way they've been implemented um, with SDOT. So 
these stay healthy streets, I think, were really put in as an attempt to provide equitable space for people and provide people outdoor space during quarantine, during pandemic. There has been some tension, however, around who can use these streets, where they are, um, and just around the conversation of who can be in public space safely. I'm wondering what recommendations you have or thoughts you have around creating safe public space for community um, and having that be not just in areas that have beautiful big parks and great infrastructure and sidewalks. Yeah, absolutely. When we were deploying our Stay Healthy Streets, um, our team really looked at um, the equity aspects of it. You know, where were there open spaces available uh, versus uh, areas of our community where there were lacking open spaces and try to target those areas that have, were, uh, 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 that had lack of uh, open space where the community can benefit and also connect to businesses and services uh, so that it's an alternate uh, a f a way for people to get to uh, these services. Um, what we heard uh, again is that uh, exactly that, you know, whose are, the, uh, are these streets for? There was some um, uh, feeling of ownership that, you know, this is my street and, you know, but it is a public street. And, and so uh, really recognizing that uh, uh, there, needs, there needed to be uh, much more of a, a dialogue and understanding and communication and, uh, uh, and then uh, trying to uh, pivot. We also heard from uh, uh, people who are uh, visually impaired. It's like, how do I know uh, this is a closed street? How do we communicate that? And how do we um, uh, provide that space so that they are able to utilize that space um, and navigate that space uh, uh, in a manner that uh, uh, is equitable and equal uh, for, uh, for them? Uh, who, uh, who definitely, um, uh, I think, it's, it's a challenging environment already. And so um, uh, what we learned is that uh, um, uh, we need to be much more flexible. We used um, the existing ne uh, neighborhood greenways, which went through a very um, a public process adopted by council, and uh, 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 the intersection controls are already in place. So it was very, uh, uh, we could deploy very quickly. But we also heard from the community, like, hey, what about this street? You know, uh, uh, it would be a, 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 a street that uh, provides that same level, but it hasn't gone to that public process. So we uh, are uh, looking at that. Uh, we heard from my director um, uh, from our Transportation Operation Division that, you know, that needs to be a part of our toolbox so that we can respond to South Park and, uh, 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 um, and these uh, communities that uh, do not have these investments, but uh, that we can very quickly uh, utilize the same tools um, and create that space so that the community can uh, um, have the same benefit where the air quality is really uh, has been historically uh, uh, poor and that we don't want to encourage more uh, of, of that same uh, uh, cut through traffic uh, that creates a, a barrier for those communities. Great, thank you. And Juan, I don't know if you are all the way back on. Feel free to leave your camera off. We were just speaking to um, Stay Healthy Streets and recommendations around how to implement those equitably, how to implement public space um, more equitably so that folks are able to experience that space safely and without fear of um, punitive measures or enforcement. And so I'm wondering if you're able to chime in on your thoughts around creating public space more equitably, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, you know, one of the things uh, that's interesting is that we don't really have a culture that creates a kind of environment for public spaces. I mean, most of our, uh, you know, leaders, public leaders tend to cater more toward the business community than they do toward the general population. And unfortunately, that, that's, that's, what, that's what we have right now. And so we need to start, you know, tend, tend to look more toward what the community needs rather than the business needs. And so, I mean, my, my feeling is, that unless we uh, we begin to open up places where people can come together in public settings, we're going to end up having people just, you know, feel left out, seriously, left out of our communities. Yeah, thank you for that. And that actually flows really well into my next question, which is, starts off for Becky, but I think can be applicable to all of your work, which is, you spoke to reaching into pockets of school communities that we haven't 
historically been able to. And I'm wondering how, what does that process look like? How is that work being done? Yeah, really good question. Um, so I would start off by saying that although, you know, we might be well-intentioned, we have to acknowledge that we also might not be the best or right person to engage with every segment of our community and really to spend the time to figure out who those right people are to work with on engagement um, and really focus on building relationships with parent groups, educators, outreach coordinators, um, local culturally based organizations folks who have the existing relationships and historical trust in communities um, is, I think, will find far more effective than um, kind of cold calling, for lack of a better word, um, folks who we have not been able to reach previously. And I'd love to extend that question in two different directions. Dong Ho, people have been asking around how how can they be involved in these processes to update you know, zoning or speed limits or advocate for better infrastructure in their neighborhood so that they aren't faced with um, punitive measures or enforcement when there are so many ho hoops to jump through and so many processes to go through in that, in that world? I think a lot of it really has to do with uh, the policies um, that because I, as a public servant, uh, um, uh, uh, incorporate and enact uh, uh, those policies that are passed by our elected officials, so our council and mayor, um, uh, through our uh, uh, through our director. And so, uh, uh, for advocacy and lasting change to re to really occur, it, it needs to ha happen through those policies. And the biggest one is really the the federal level, uh, where. Um, the federal standards and laws uh, dictate how the state should operate. So find out those inequities. Why are these in place? A lot of it has to do with these guidance that a lot of people put together. And so uh, find out uh, uh, how to uh, make your voice heard. It could be the FHWA and the, and the uh, uh, transportation uh, uh, secretary uh, and writing to uh, our senators and, uh, uh, and our uh, representatives. Uh, to the state level uh, and the state laws, like the two state law that I pointed to, I mean, those uh, uh, can be changed by our elected officials, right? Um, and we have very easy access and we have uh, a very caring elected officials that uh, have been uh, incorporating uh, the input from our, uh, from our communities uh, to our city and uh, our elected officials as well. So again, um, uh, if you enact a policy change, it lasts, uh, uh, long lasting changes, uh, not just through a couple locations, but it's like, it's, it's very systemic. Totally. Um, Becky, this is another question, bouncing it back to you around sort of the ways in which the communities of schools that you work with have received this update of policies, considering that so many students are not in school right now, considering that people are using the streets in such different ways. What does that engagement look like so far? Yeah, um, well, I will say that overwhelmingly, we've had a really positive response. Um, I think I mentioned that for a lot of our partners, this should have happened a while ago. Um, so it's kind of felt like a long time coming. Um, there have been a lot of, or I shouldn't say a lot, there have been some questions about folks who do have existing relationships with police and law enforcement integrated into their Safe Routes to School program. Um, I would say overwhelmingly among those concerns and questions um, is largely related to the funding structure and funding mechanism, um, usually tied to a crossing guard program. Um, and what we've been discussing with partners and um, as we're looking to develop better engagement resources and strategies is looking at advocating for changing some of those funding mechanisms. Um, crossing guards are essential partners in Safe Routes to School programs. We need them before, you know, arrival and dismissal times. And as someone I think mentioned in the chat, um, issues with disproportionately low income and communities of color arriving to school late um, and not having a crossing guard present. We need to also be looking at correcting, correcting that. 
Um, but I think that overwhelmingly we've had really good feedback and response. And I think folks are really seeing the opportunity of, of shifting gears. That's great to hear. Um, and then a question for both of you is sort of in the work that you're doing right now, there's so much to be done. It feels like it feels like this conversation around enforcement and policing and active transportation is one that's been going on for a very long time and continues to go on. And I'm wondering if you can look into the future, what your vision of safe, healthy, connected, active transportation communities look like. So how do we move past or through enforcement and what does that what does that end goal look like to you um so i think uh, we as humans and uh, as a species we're social beings and uh, we uh, gather together for that reason we are communal um, i think our at least our nation and um, much of the world um, has shifted and changed uh, um, to how we operate. If we, in my ideal uh, situation, uh, I look to uh, communities that were developed before the automobile, um, where how did people get around, right? So, um, and then uh, these uh, uh, places that we go to for vacations and uh, 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 lovely, uh, uh, old, uh, older, uh, uh, beautiful cities, and even uh, newer cities that are connected, um, they're built for humans. They're built for society. They're built to uh, uh, have everything at human scale and uh, have uh, their transportation network set up uh, for uh, a much more of a holistic and environmentally friendly and sustainable manner, right? So the connections are mass transit, uh, it's prioritized and in the urban centers and where, uh, where the main streets are, it's really prioritized for the businesses and people interaction. And that uh, land use is set up so that you don't have to travel very far. Um, as you get older and you're not able to, uh, to drive, you're not excluded from, uh, from the community that uh, that you've uh, uh, grown up with in suburban uh, suburban settings, for uh, for example, and that you have to now move. Um, that you, you know you can you can age in place, and that you have a network of support uh, that you uh, are grown old old with. Yeah, thanks. That's really great. I would just um, echo a couple of things you've mentioned around shifting our land use planning and policies um, to really focus on walkable and bikeable communities that allow folks to thrive where they are. Um, and I'm sorry that Juan Jose fell off the call. I think that he was really touching a lot on how we need to be shifting, reimagining our public spaces for community gathering. Um, and I think that through the pandemic, we've all seen a huge opportunity in that with not just street closures to you know slow down traffic and make it easier to walk and bike around, although those are great things. Um, really, just allowing people to uh, live in their truest um, expression of selves and um, be able to uh, connect with one another. I think that that's more clear than ever how how critical that is. Totally appreciate that so much and appreciate. The work that both of you as well as Juan do every day to make our streets safer and more accessible for, for all the folks who are using them. Um, so I want to thank you for your time and thank all of our attendees for being here with us today. Um, our next session for the day will be at 4 p.m. It'll be at active transportation advocacy around the state. So how are we making Washington State a great place for all folks who are living Within our, within our state? How do we make it so that no matter the resources or zoning or experiences that we have in different areas of the state, we're the number one bike state for everyone in, in our boundaries. So I will also be dropping here a quick feedback form. Your feedback is very much appreciated on this session and all of our sessions. So take a moment to fill that out. Thank you again for all of you being here today and I hope you have a great afternoon and we'll see you at four o'clock. Bye.